Welcome uh, to our reflection on the Corona crisis as a focal point on the relationship between science and religion. In six interviews from around the world, I have addressed this topic. You may have seen them before, or you can watch them afterwards as you like it. Now you, Father Bruntrup, um, you have listened to all of the interviews and I'm grateful that you will complete this series by summarizing and systemizing the diverse impressions of the interviews and compare them with the situation in Germany. So thank you very much for spending your time on this topic. Gladly and most welcome. I have suggested five aspects to structure the impressions we have heard in the interviews. Uh, first of all, um, it is the theory of dialogue. How do we relate to the empirical findings, for example, of the virologists? Uh, when I speak of we, I think about um, society as a whole, but also on uh, religions and on church. So how do we relate to the empirical findings? Professor Bruntrup. Well, I found it interesting that there were huge differences between the different continents and countries. Um, when I talk about the religion and science dialogue, I mean, in all countries, there are groups that are anti-scientific. We learned that in the United States of America, about 50% of the population still does not believe in natural evolution on religious grounds. Um, but then we also learned that, for example, in India, which in many respects is a less developed country than the United States economically and scientifically. We learned that in India, all religions, Christianity, Catholicism, Hinduism, Islam, basically um, endorsed the government approach, which was led by science. Whereas we learned that, for example, from Russia, that the Orthodox Church is bitterly divided into a fundamentalist wing, which is also very critical of science, and a more liberal science-friendly wing. And we learn from Brazil that there's a certain form of evangelicals that also exist in the US that are very critical of science. Um, so I found surprising insights there that, for example, here in Germany, we, it's more like India. Uh, we have the, the groups that are religious and anti-science, anti-virology anti, uh, are mostly not Christian. They are right-wing, politically right-wing movements, but mostly not Christian. So it was a very diverse field. That's my first impression. Yeah. I also reflected on Boris Rehme, who told that in Italy he has something of integration of uh, scientific insights into the religion uh, concepts. Well, I think his idea was that um, religion, and I think everybody agreed among our speakers here, everybody agreed that religion has to respect science and religion that contradicts scientific findings is in trouble. So a modern religion for the 21st century, I think all of our speakers agreed, has to be a religion that is in agreement with science and not fighting evolution or other scientific findings or virology for that matter. So what Rehme said then, well, but, <laughs> religion should not simply support science, but put it into a wider context, so to speak. And the wider context is, that should protect us from hubris. Even if we do know, and we actually we do know a lot about the scientific world and the scientific facts, and we have accumulated vast amounts of knowledge in the last 50 years or so, Still, we can learn from this little virus that our knowledge is limited, rapidly changing. And if it rapidly changes, it means that a lot of what we thought we knew 
is false or was false and it's very limited and we still we, of course we cannot defeat death we cannot defeat suffering with science so we we tend to overestimate the power of science and religion should not fight science but tell us well science is not everything there's so much more to life than science and science cannot answer all the questions so as wittgenstein said if all the scientific questions have been answered the real questions of life have not yet been answered yeah. on the other hand i was uh, rather disappointed for, from germany because I did not, I could not imagine how much we have a breeding ground for science denial as well. Many people uh, stick to uh, the alternative media or um, conspiracy theories. What do you think about this phenomenon? Well, I don't think this is specifically related to religion. I think that there is a natural tendency for people to have a simple explanation of what is happening. And there's also a natural inclination to belong to the group that is in the know, to a special group that has special knowledge. So both of us, is, both things are very attractive to understand what's going on and to be in that privileged group who has that spe specific knowledge. And conspiracy theories satisfy both needs. They give us a simple explanation to what is going on in the world. They make a complex world simple, and they also give us the feeling to belong to the epistemically privileged. And in addition to this, the, the, those are the two motives, I think, and they are universal. And the other thing is that because of the internet, now every theory, as absurd as it may be, absurd as it may be, will find a place where it can be published. For example, there is an entire website devoted to the topic that the Jesuit order, the Jesuits, were behind 9-11 and Father Kolvenbach, Superior General of uh, the Jesuits, commanded the Twin Towers to be destroyed. And they collect all kinds of evidence why the Jesuits destroyed the Twin Towers. Um, of course, that's utterly absurd. But there is a website. So... And this website is just a website like the New York Times or Der Spiegel. So for, the, for many people, so well, there's evidence in the internet. So I, it's a supported view. And I think that's a danger we have not really reflected enough about that everything can be taken at face value as a fact in the internet. Um, and that's the reason why in Germany and in many other countries, we have these large movements of science deniers because they think they're still in the scientific method because it, they read it somewhere uh, in an authoritative mode i.e the internet let's turn to the second point of interest um, the concept of man um, what does the corona crisis say us about uh, the concept of man well i think one topic i could listen to Oh, one topic I found in many of the contributions is it, it teaches us a certain form of humility, understanding that we are, um, first of all, not all knowing. We were surprised by the virus, virus. We are weak and vulnerable. Something as tiny as a virus can kill millions of millions of people. We are people, we are beings that will eventually die. Our mortality has been brought into focus. And that's the main reason why people are afraid of this virus, because they know it can possibly kill me. If that wasn't the case, if, if all that could possibly happen, that I have to spend two months, uh, two weeks in a hospital, that would not make the virus such a threat but that it might end my life or the life of my loved ones makes it so threatening. And so the virus all of a sudden, especially for us in the first world, where somebody who is 40 or 50 or even 20 um, doesn't think much about death, the virus reminds us of our mortality. Um, 
and so those are common themes. Themes. So the the um, dealing with death, becoming more humble, seeing us also as a part of nature as a whole. So we we, we tend to forget about nature, and not we for, tend to forget about that we are related to nature as a whole, and even something as small as a virus can have enormous consequences for us as the human race. Uh, let's focus a little bit uh, um, on the human nature. Uh, Billy Grassi said, uh, the human nature is the problem. Um, he said, um, the evolved human nature. The behavior in the brains are ill-suited to the complexity of our world. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree completely with this. Um, especially when we get back to our f what you mentioned earlier, the conspiracy theories and so on. So the world has become way too complex for our simple brains that develop basically probably to live in small villages, interacting maybe with 100 or 200 or 300 people. Um, now, everything we do has repercussions. Something a, a farmer does in China, selling something on a market has repercussions, not within decades, but within days in the US, in Germany, in, in what have you, South America, Brazil. So I think our mind is not yet ready for this. Um, that's still something we cannot literally wrap our mind around. Okay, let's turn to the third point, theology. Um, what skills, um, what religious skills can help in coping with the crisis? Or is this question already misleading? Uh, is um, religion must not be functionalized is uh, one word of Dr. Rehme. Well, of course, religion is not a function of anything or survival, for example. That would be a completely naturalist biological explanation of religion that religious people have better chances of survival or something along those lines. From the internal understanding of religion, it's much more than that. Um, but we can, of course, and that's an interesting question, um, and I think practically all of them, all of our interview partners have mentioned this, is that religion gives us skills to cope with adverse situations like the pandemic. So they give us skills to cope with our anxieties, threats, especially in dealing with suffering and dying. Because science has no ultimate question, uh, answer to sufferance, uh, suffering and dying. Even the best science cannot avoid that humans are suffering at times, and the best science cannot avoid or get rid of death. So science is not a way to alleviate or to completely alleviate um, suffering and dying. So there is a deeper dimension that we are mortal beings living a finite existence, a very threatened existence, and religion is a way of coping with this for two reasons, at least. Um, first of all, it, it gives us the experience of being not alone, being in a community, being connected by prayer. And also, and I think this is the ultimate reason, it gives us the hope and trust that whatever may happen, even if I die, even if my, my natural life comes to an end, there is a su supreme loving reality we call God that will not let me fall into non-existence. But if there is a loving God, we have another problem. It's the problem of theodicy. I think Antje Jacqueline uh, talked about it as well. How can... Uh, 
a deadly virus be consigned with a loving God? For that's, that's the deepest philosophical problem for all the big, the great theistic traditions. Um, and my personal view on this is um, if God can really interfere with this world so that he could like blow up the tracks leading to Auschwitz, then there is no good explanation that he doesn't do that more often. Or if he could just now interfere with the, the mind of a researcher and implant the perfect medication to COVID-19 into that mind, why doesn't he do this? In, I think in the, in, the diff, in the tradition of process theology, I would argue that God can't, God cannot do this. Um, but he can guide us towards seeking the truth, doing signs, taking care of others, not being self selfish, uh, seeing the social problems of this virus, helping those in need, and so on. So God can guide us by all the ideals he has implanted in our, into our consciousness and into our heart to find our way out of this crisis. Um, but God cannot simply make the virus go away as many evangelicals think, because then the problem of, um, of theodicy really arises. Why doesn't he do it? Yeah. I think this uh, phenomenon appeared in some interviews. It appeared in the US, in Russia, for, for example, uh, also in Brazil. And uh, what Bishop Balman uh, told us was also very important. God is not a magi magician. And so I think this corresponds to your answer as well. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's come to the ethics. What do we learn from the corona crisis for treating people, especially in um, situation, in palliative situations? Well, there was the, uh, is the discussion, for example, should we use maximum life extending care with all the machinery of um, supplemental, not only supplemental oxygen, but very forceful uh, mechanisms to press air into the lungs and then still most of these people die. Should we really go to this extent or should we accept that this is at certain points we should turn these machines off? Um, th this is definitely something we have to learn with these um, uh, viruses. For example, in, in when we deal with the elderly, many people who were like 80, 90 or older, when they get corona, should we go to the maximum of extent of preserving their lives or should we have them die in dignity? That's one thing we have to think about these palliative situations. Um, in ethics, I think that's not even the most important and all of them basically raise this, is not the most important thing. The most important ethical issue in Corona is the injustice. Um, those who are poor suffer the most from it, have no medication, have no high-tech intensive care units to treat them, and they are often the least responsible. Um, I forget who said it, but someone said, it's the rich people who travel all over the world and and, and they fill the airplanes and make the, make the virus travel within hours from one continent to another's. But the poor people who have never ever seen the inside of an airplane, they die from the virus. Yes, this was Billy Grassi. Yes. And, and yeah, I remember now, it's Billy Grassi. So, so there is probably, we don't know at this point, because there's no statistics, how many people die in Africa from Corona? Because there are so many people already sick, for example, with uh, um, HIV AIDS. And so they're already weak. Uh, 
But on, there is no Robert Koch Institute or whatever institute counting the number of deaths. So I would assume there is the number of deaths in Africa is way higher than we know, or is reported to the media. But nobody cares really all that much. It's the forgotten continent again. Um, I think those are the deep ethical issues of, of Corona. Yeah. Coming back to one issue, um, you mentioned uh, the concept of dignity. Archbishop Jacqueline told us that um, there is some uh, like a misinterpretation in, uh, in Sweden. Um, they translated the UN, uh, the convention, uh, they translated dignity with value. Does it make a difference? Well, it's, an, it's a somewhat unfortunate translation because um, value also means something quantitative, as she said, like the commercial value of an entity. You pay a thousand euros for your TV and another TV is maybe 500 euros. Um, um, but even in German, German, we have that Wert and Werte uses the same expression for something very tangible, monetary, but also something very deep, deep, like the deepest values. So I don't, I think that's just a superficial problem uh, of how do you call something. The deeper problem is, and I, it can be made clear from what she mentioned about the Swedish society. Um, the Swedish society was unable to care for the elderly to the extent that would be would we would hope for if all human beings have the same value. If you look at the numbers in the Swedish society, how many old people died from Corona, then given the knowledge and expertise they have in Sweden, I mean medical knowledge and expertise, this was compared to Norway, Sweden, uh, Norway, Finland, or Germany completely unnecessary that so many elderly die. And then I would ask the question, is the dignity of the old person still at the forefront or is it, is it seen enough that a society allows for this? Basically saying, well, they have only like three or four years to live. So why should we go to these great length to protect them? Okay. Uh, let's turn to the last um, aspect, the fifth aspect, the transfer to the ecological crisis. Can we learn from the Corona crisis and uh, make some insights fruitful for the ecological crisis? I think this was again obvious in all, all our interviews. Um, I found very interesting what Matthew Chandran Connell said in India, that he sees that our metaphysics of nature, nature basically being a machine, a Cartesian machine, uh, in which there are only objects, there are no subjects, there's no feeling in nature, Feeling is, uh, nature is just a big machine and we can treat it as an object and we are not really part of it because we are soul-based beings, very different from nature. And nature is just a resource, from, a resource from which we can take whatever we need and want. And he says this notion of nature as being that's not really deeply related to us, not even like us, is simply a resource we can exploit that this picture of nature is partly, partly responsible for the ecological crisis and the ecological crisis partly responsible for the virus. That's, that was a very substantial point. And I think Christianity has to ask itself whether it contributed to this misunderstanding that nature is simply an object at our disposal. 
I don't think that's what the Bible says, but I think the Christian tradition has contributed to this view. Matthew Chandran Kundal also uh, pointed to the attitude we have and uh, said we need a change from the um, need based, from the greed based to need based. I think this is also an insight concerning the culture we live in. Well, I think that's related to the, the capitalism issue. Yeah. Capitalism is, 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 need, is based on greed. But why do we have all the commercials here on YouTube or wherever you are watching this now? Uh, because they want to trigger your greed. You, you want to buy something which 10 minutes ago you weren't even thinking about. Um, and we could learn, I think one of the things we could learn in the Corona crisis during the lockdown is that there are so many things that we don't do now that we abs that we obviously do not need because we cannot leave our homes and go here and go there, go shopping, go traveling, go to a restaurant. And we could easily do without all those things. And our life was still fulfilled. Um, so that's something we can learn from, from the crisis that we are way too greedy. Uh, and that our basic needs, what we really need is something else. For example, what really helped us in the crisis was a functioning family to support us. Those who were alone were in a pretty dire situation. Those who had a functioning family or religious community or whatever were in a much better situation due to the lockdown. So we could learn what we really need, what is essential for human life and what is only greed. Uh, so th I think that's a very important point. Yeah, um, let us hope that it is an effect that it has an effect on the learning for the ecological crisis. Yeah, I think it is a very interesting completion of our series of interviews, and I thank you very much, Professor Brundrup, um, for your time that you spent with us in answering these five complex questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.